eight. <coughs> and um, <coughs> before I came up here, Shay came over and said, did you have a title for this yet? <coughs> and uh, you know, everyone, there was announcements going on and stuff, so it's kind of hard to hear, and I said, um, infirmities, or infirmities, either way, infirmity or infirmities in prayer. And he says, he said to me, infirmities and prayer? <laughs> and I said, you know, in my heart, I said, you know, yeah, yeah, infirmity and prayer. Because we want to talk about <clears throat> prayer, and we want to talk about it in the context of prayer. <clears throat> yeah. Um, because I, you know, some of you have heard me comment and whatever uh, about prayer, and, and um, I have, um, <clears throat> I have ideas of what I feel like prayer should entail. <clears throat> but the scriptures to me, and especially here in Romans 8, are very clear about it. I think that all of us at one time in our walk have missed the real import of prayer. And I don't just mean the fact of uh, religiously doing an action, but in talking with God and we kind of described her on Thursday night as calling up God, you know, calling him up. Hey, I want to talk to you. Just want to see how you're doing. Want you to, you know, and you got, to get, got any comments? <clears throat> Instead of just kind of, um, <clears throat> kind of a picture I've got uh, sometimes of the way some people approach prayers. Jesus is sitting on the throne and they, come into the throne room and they back up their trash truck and they dump it all into his lap and then pull off, you know, all their garbage, all their problems, all of this and that. And they, they kind of go back out going, okay, Lord, now fix everything. <clears throat> but I want to talk to it, talk about prayer in, in this context of Romans 8 and to begin to let the Holy Spirit speak to us. Speak to our hearts, not our heads. And you know, for him to be able to do that, we have to, <clears throat> we have to tune our heart. Y'all know that, don't you? We do, we have to tune our heart to him. We don't automatically come into a service in tune. Some people do, not every time though. No one does every time. <clears throat> And sometimes it's a difficult task to go from our mind to his or our, what we were thinking about to his. <clears throat> I know <clears throat> I have gone down to altar calls in my younger days and, <clears throat> you know, they said, well, just come down and pray. And I would pray and I would find myself you know, talking to the Lord as best I could, but my mind would keep drifting to the things that were on my mind when I came in. <clears throat> and I mean, I would do it like even at night, praying. Okay, Lord, you know, I've done this before. I'm going to spend an hour in prayer with you. <clears throat> and golly, trying to tame my mind. It's just crazy sometimes how easily it keeps going back and go. And you don't even realize when you're back thinking on that and you go, oh, I'm supposed to be praying. I mean, if, imagine if we did that to, to a human being, you know, we're talking to him and then we're kind of drift away, you know, and we start thinking about, oh, oh yeah, and they're still standing there, you know, and oh, oh yeah, I'm talking to you, you know, and then we're back over here, oh, oh, I, you know, <clears throat> I, but I don't know about you, but I've done that to the Lord. So I want to read these scriptures in uh, Romans 8, <clears throat> starting with uh, verse uh, 26. Romans 8, verse 26. 
Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity, and that's the translation I have in my particular Bible, and it is supposed to be a better word uh, that has infirmities in the King James, but it, nonetheless, it's infirmity or infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with, with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine, predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> he's... Basically, he's, he says, you know, in verse 26, he starts presenting the case that uh, there is an infirmity <clears throat> that we have. You know, maybe, maybe we're not aware of it. You know, there's an infirmity that we have. <clears throat> and um, that infirmity is along the lines of prayer, and it's along the lines of not really knowing what we should pray for. <clears throat> and keeping your place here, I just want to present a quick little glance at some, some possible reflections on prayer. And it's over in the Gospel of John, chapter 12. And I want to use the, these scriptures <clears throat> to be seen in relationship to communing with the Lord or praying. <clears throat> it is how these three people mentioned here in John 12, it's how they related to the Lord. Therefore, how they, quote unquote, commune with the Lord or how they, quote unquote, communicate with the Lord or what basis they do that on. So we're in Gospel of John, chapter 12, and verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Verse 2, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. And I want to just drop down to verse 7. Then Jesus said, or then said Jesus, Let her alone, for the day of my burial hath she kept this. Okay? <clears throat> so one of the first things I want you to know, and also to remember the other scriptures that have talked about Lazarus and Martha and Mary, that you have this picture of three different relationships that Jesus, it says here, Jesus sat at the table with Lazarus. It says that Mary came and sat at his feet and anointed him. And it, it also, in the other scriptures that have covered this area, mentioned that, and it says it here, and Martha served. And you remember the story. I mean, you remember that part where, where Martha, she... <clears throat> She's like, you know, make her get up and come serve. I'm trying to serve you. I'm doing the best I can to please you. I want to give you the best. I, this, this is one form of how we commune with the Lord over and how we pray and, and the basis of what we pray and the emphasis of what we pray. It's all about serving ministry lord i'm going to be preaching so and so i need you to bless and use me and da da da, da. <clears throat> you know uh, i'm going to be on an outreach and i need you to 
you, you, get, you get the gist of it. That there are people, folks, that really don't pray unless they got something they're going to have to do for the Lord. <laughs> you know, there are people who don't search the scriptures unless they're going to be shared. Somebody says, well, would you share it so and so time? They go, oh, boy. So I better get in the word. Yeah. Where's your shield of faith during the rest of the time? The shield of faith, the word of God. <clears throat> just, just a thought. No condemnation. No condemn to the nation. But anyway, <clears throat> no condemnation. But there is this other, well, there's actually these two other aspects that I think are really good. You have Lazarus sitting at the table face to face with Jesus. Com you know, communion face to face. That's good. Amen? That's good. Sitting at the table. <clears throat> but Jesus mentions, I mean, he mentions all of this, but the thing that he, he, that draws out his heart is what Mary's doing. And, and one of the things we'll get into as we proceed here is that Jesus' view of things is very different than ours. You know, we know from the scripture, it says his ways are not our ways. Okay, his ways are not our ways. But, but he, he sees things just incredibly different. So Jesus sees this as a, a situation of death and burial. Now, how important is that? Well, that's what we're going to find out. Jesus responds to it based on death and burial. Jesus reacts to others reacting to her. And he has to explain to them, look, this isn't what you think. This isn't, this isn't just a girl, you know, at my feet adoring me. This isn't just sex or this isn't just this or that this is something that has to do with me this has to do with christ and him crucified this has to do with eternal reality that's what's going on here let her alone i love those words let her alone <clears throat> why because you don't understand you don't understand this kind of communion you don't understand this kind of a relationship. And so um, you don't have to keep your place here as long as you keep it in Romans. But let's go over to Matthew chapter 15 because <clears throat> I was reminded of this and I thought, well, this would be a good example for a, another kind of prayer, <clears throat> though it doesn't directly mention prayer. Let's <clears throat> see. Um, Still trying to get there myself. Matthew 15. I thought I had it, but as I read Luke 15, I realized the prodigal son wouldn't fit the bill right there at that moment. 15. And Um, let's just start at verse 23. But he answered her not a word. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not right to take the children's bread and to cast it before dogs. This is Jesus talking to a Syrophoenician woman. She came and cried out, Have mercy on me. And he answered her not a word. Okay, folks, when it comes to prayer, sometimes the Lord doesn't answer and we don't know why. And so we, we press him and we say, give me, help me, give me an explanation, which is what she's saying here. And, and uh, <clears throat> um, 
And then in verse 24, he says, he answered, this is an answer, he answered, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so we go, what is that? What? That doesn't sound like Jesus. That doesn't make sense. <clears throat> And then verse 25, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help. But he answered and said, It is not right to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. What? What? And she said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. There's something going on in her. There's something that is getting past the word of God that condemns. Do y'all really understand that? There is something that in the face of the situation, we would just fall down and melt and cry and go, why won't God help me? Or why won't he answer me? Why won't this and that? <clears throat> but when your heart is after the Lord, when there's something in you that's after him, you press past his words to get to him, his heart. And then you know Jesus' response. Just, oh, I've never seen faith like this. He doesn't go, listen, woman, this is the way it's written. I'm the boss. We're going to do it my way. I'm telling you. Well, I notice I said Jesus doesn't do it that way. Some, yeah. some people do, some husbands or fathers. Or. But still, still, she doesn't really know him enough to approach for the right thing. So she's willing to get just crumbs that fall from the table that Jesus and Lazarus are sitting at. Something of the earth, just something of the earth. Just any, you know, just drop, you know, there's an old hymn, I forget how it goes, it's something like, <clears throat> you know, mercy drops from heaven. Lord, you know, send down mercy drops. I'm going, my God, we've been raised up and made to sit together in Christ. We're one with him. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, just, you know, I'm just a poor person on there. Just drop down some mercy drops. Just drop down some crumbs from the table. <clears throat> and I'm telling you, he wants more than that. He wants much more than that. <clears throat> Excuse me with all this noise. All right, let's go back to Romans 8. <clears throat> So in verse 26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity, for we know not what we should pray as we ought. That's an infirmity. And one of the things that I've found about the Lord, and we saw it in, this la in those last scriptures there in Matthew, <clears throat> is that, you know, Jesus doesn't answer questions directly a lot of times. Have you ever noticed that? In the scripture, I'm talking about in the scripture, that when they come up and ask him a question, he many times does not answer directly. It's like, what? You know, when he answers, what is that? You know? And uh, it's just the same thing, you know. I mean, we're praying to God, and he just doesn't give us the answer we want because we're praying from a whole different mindset, you know, and we don't realize. See, we think, we think, what's wrong with God, or why won't God answer this, or, you know, Master, carest thou not that we perish, or all of this crazy stuff to him. I mean, it's, that's what it sounds like to him. I mean, to, to him, he's listening, and he's, you know, he hears us saying, is yellow square or round? That's kind of what it sounds like to him. He's going, what, you know? So he answers according to his mind, and then we go, what, you know? <laughs> you know? How many trains does a smile have? <laughs> you know? What? You know, I mean, that's the way we sound, but we don't know that, and we don't believe that because we don't know we're infirmed. Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. 
who, what, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to give you an example of you <laughs> and me. <laughs> Praise God. So basically what he doesn't get is we're, at, we're asking for scraps from the table when he's set the table for us. And would you like some examples of Jesus kind of doing that? Let me, let me give you some. Keep, again, let's keep our place here in Romans. Let's go to Matthew 19. <clears throat> And it's good to go into the scripture to make sure we prove our point, right? <clears throat> Matthew 19 and verse 9. <clears throat> this is Jesus talking. <clears throat> and he says, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso, whosoever marrieth her who is put away, doth commit adultery. Verse 10. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. This, this is what they got out of that. Okay, well, nobody should get married. <laughs> God, my Lord, is that really what he's thinking about? But he's not thinking about what we're thinking about either. That's why we would have been there and, and said something else stupid. Excuse my French. <laughs> but so then verse 14 but Jesus said let's see let me make sure I'm in the right place um, verse 11 but he said unto them all men cannot receive this saying except they to whom it is given meaning they who get it <clears throat> for their their for there are some eunuchs who were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have, been, who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that's able to receive it, let him receive it. What? What? Again, we think there's something wrong with him. We go, why would he answer like that? That doesn't even make sense to me. Well, you don't make sense to him. We don't make sense to him. We don't come from where he's coming from. We don't think like what he thinks. We think like what we want on the earth. We think about flesh and blood. We think about our lives down here. Let's, let's, um, let's look at a, another one. Uh, John chapter 2. John 2, and starting with verse 18. <clears throat> now you're all familiar with this one. John 2, beginning with verse 18, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered, this is his answer, Jesus answered, and said unto them, Destroy this temple, in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was, was this temple in building, and wilt thou raise it up in three days? Verse 21, But he spoke of the temple of his body. And he's talking about the cross. He's talking about destroy this temple. He's, everything, his mind goes there. His mind is there. His heart is there. It is, the cross is the place where he best manifested his nature. The cross is the place where he accomplished everything, not in his three and a half years of ministry. At the cross is where he accomplished it all. And so he, the, it's hard for us to think like this. It's hard for all we, the cross was a historical event 2,000 years ago. It's fading fast. You know, praise God for the glory of walking around heaven on streets of golden gates of pearl. He's not thinking the streets of golden gates of pearl. Everything within his being is tied up in this bundle called Christ and him crucified. And this is what he exists for. And Mary is anointing him, and he goes, look, she's doing this for my burial. This is important. Be quiet. 
Martha, let her alone. This is important to me. Well, what's important to me is we got this ministry and we got to feed you and I'm trying to take care of you. And don't you get it? And I love you, Jesus. And he's just going, my God. Woman? I'm sorry. In that case. <laughs> and there is this deep, deep loss. He experiences because we who should know him we who should be with, that's what communion is, to be with him where he's at. Because it's not communion if he's with us where we're at. It's not communion. You can call it what, you can call it a bunch of stuff, but it's not communion. <laughs> okay. And I'll even, I'll even allow it as if I have any say in any of this anyway. But I mean, the, the point is him and his view, and his heart, and to find that, and to quit walking crippled, or praying crippled, yes. being infirmed, yes. and constantly doing it, yes. constantly proceeding that way. And let's just flip over one more, and this is still in John chapter 12, and most of you know this one, because I've quoted this one a lot over the years, because it's such a great example. <clears throat> John, the Gospel of John, still in or in chapter 12, starting with verse 20. <clears throat> <clears throat> and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, who was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Okay, so these guys, these are Greeks now. This is this is. This is other than Jews, and they have come there, and they literally seek out one of Jesus' disciples, and they say, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. We're not here for the, the bars or the houses of prostitution or everything. We want to see Jesus. Okay, so Jesus is going to go, oh, great day in the morning. <laughs> There are people that are finally seeking me instead of the devil or the flesh or whatever, however our minds go. <clears throat> and then verse 23, and Jesus answered. This is Jesus' answer. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. <clears throat> verily, verily, I say unto you, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. <clears throat> but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. All right. <clears throat> so so they, they're admiring Jesus. They're what you would call glorifying Jesus, um, but Jesus doesn't see it that way. He sees it as, no, the hour for my glorification is coming a seed falling in the ground and dying. The cross. Am I right? <clears throat> They've come up to worship. They've come to glory. We want to see Jesus. Glory to Jesus. We want to honor you. You, you know, <clears throat> we don't know all that they would say. <clears throat> when Jesus starts talking about glorification, he talks about the cross. Jesus starts talking about, <clears throat> if you want to see me, see me at the cross. <laughs> he actually goes on the next couple of verses after that is basically if you it's if you want to see me see me at the cross if you want to meet me meet me at the cross that's verse uh, 25 and if any man serve me let him follow me well he's talking about falling into the ground and dying I mean I don't know how he could have said it any more plain but maybe Jesus could have just said look followers Follow me to the cross. Because it's so tricky when he just says, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. You know, what does that mean? I don't get that. This is confusing. It's not, you know, it's not confusing. We're, we don't want to hear what he's really saying. And he doesn't want to just say, look, if you're going to be a follower, <clears throat> follow me to the cross because he wants us to hear him, not be forced into 
<clears throat> a belief system that may be true, but we choose not to embrace because we've never heard his heart. We've never heard him. We've never heard it come out of his being. We see it on paper, but folks, that's a lot different. Now, you know, I've mentioned this before. You can email somebody and really get in trouble or text them because they go, what? What are you saying? Because their mind's somewhere else and your mind's over here and when the two shall never meet, you go, I can't believe they said that about me. It's even, it's even worse with this adjusting, whatever you call it, <clears throat> when you, you write a word. And <laughs> I, had, I had some doozies in my life and because they're doozies, I'm not gonna tell you what they were. So there is this thing where Jesus says, if you want to see me, <clears throat> you have to see me as a corn of wheat that falls into the ground and die. And if you want to follow me, that's the next couple of verses. Any man, if you're going to follow me, this is how you do that. <clears throat> and so we're, the, the Greeks, when they came, had no thought of that. Cross, what's that? No, no. Let's glorify Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I'm, let's just glory. And he's going, you know, I don't know your language. <laughs> That's what he's thinking. I don't know your language. I don't know this language. Back to Romans. Romans 8. <clears throat> Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. The scriptures are telling us we don't know what to pray for. That the problem is we don't, he calls it an infirmity. He didn't call it immaturity. He didn't call it, well, you know, you you've missed the point this time. <laughs> he doesn't call it that. He says, you, you're as good as crippled. When it comes to this area, you are crippled. You don't know how to pray. You can pray. You might pray. You might even pray a lot, but you don't know what to pray for as you ought. You, to me, my view of that, this prayer relationship is you're infirmed. How are we going to get it? Well, we have to find his heart. We have to, we have to ask the Holy Spirit, who, which, which these scriptures speak about. Verse, well, verse 26 and 27, but verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. And then in the middle of it, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us. And then verse 27, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. <clears throat> A couple of things to notice here. Likewise, the spirit helps our infirmity. He doesn't just help. He doesn't, listen, he doesn't just intercede to get your answer to God Get, get your prayer request to God answered. He's working on the infirm person. He helps our infirmity. He's trying to, he's trying to get us lined up. See, we always go, oh, the, well, praise God, you know. Even if I don't know what to pray for as I ought, uh, I got the Holy Spirit, and he'll work it out, and I can still be, you know, do -do -do, and everything's going to be just fine, you know? Everything will work out. No, that's not what, that's not what he's working on. <clears throat> and the way these scriptures are worded, it's just, verse 27 is just beautiful. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit. There is this thing where he's trying to uh, bring two things together. 
the mind of the spirit and our hearts being brought to one purpose. He's searching our heart, trying to find us, find where we're at, and if we'll get with the spirit, the mind of the spirit. The mind of the spirit. Well, that's, I see that in the, the verse in front of it that says that he does with groanings. That the spirit of God groans to accomplish his purpose, which we, we know is just a few verses down, is Jesus' image in us. Not just salvation. salvation. If you're praying, you're probably already saved. Unless you're praying to somebody else. But <clears throat> salvation is not the issue, and we'll see that because it's pretty clear there. The Spirit's intercession is for us. We'll, we'll go, I know, he's... It's intercession for me so I can get my prayers through. No, he's praying for you because you're messed up. He's interceding for you, <clears throat> trying to get his mind and his purpose worked into you because your prayers are all, you know, crumbs falling from the table. Oh, Lord, you know, we pick up a crumb and, oh, Lord, up there on the table, way up there. Fix this, and, you know. Fix my crummy life. <laughs> you know? And all these things that are, you know, messing with me and disturbing my soul. Make my soul where my soul is completely peaceful by removing everybody else. God thinks it's pretty crummy too. <laughs> he doesn't understand that language. He figures that we know better. He figures we're one with him. He figures that we feel what he feels. He figures that his mind is in us. I mean, for you have the mind of Christ. Well, we may have it, but we may not access it. <clears throat> so he assumes, he assumes that once I, you know, Jesus is thinking, once I died and made them one and I bore all their sins and took all that away and all this kind of stuff, you know, then... Now they just want to be with me. Everything's been removed. It was an obstacle. And now, but they seem more interested in fixing the earth instead of being with me where I'm at. And they're all involved in what's wrong instead of what's right. And the Holy Spirit's going, I am not going to do that. I'm not going to intercede. I'm joined with Anything that's working in you that's not according to the will of God. Well, you know, okay, let's look, let's look at that. The will of God. Verse 27. The end of it. <clears throat> or middle of, of the Spirit. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now listen to the next verse. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to whom are thee called according to his purpose. Folks, the will of God and the purpose of God is the same thing. What's the will of God? His purpose. What's the purpose of God? Do my will. Be with me. Understand me. Know me. Let's be one. Yes, theologically I'm one and that's good enough for me. And he's going, that ain't good enough for me. I died to do something here. And we go, well, praise God, Jesus died to do stuff that we'll never enter into. But at least we're saved. Really? 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 Is that enough? I know it's not enough for him. Is that enough for us that we won't press past all that? And so it just, he just, just blatantly hits you with it. He says, you're infirmed and you're trying to get me to bless all things but you won't be after me in my heart to conform to my image and if you were there all of those things wouldn't need prayer they all work to that end that you be conformed to my image but you're praying over things 
and all things would work. You wouldn't have to have 80 million prayers over this thing and that thing and this thing because they would work together to bring you to the image of Christ. It would simplify your prayer life. He says it, doesn't he? He says it right here. I mean, he's going, you're infirmed. You don't know what to pray for. God's searching your heart and trying to match it up with the mind of Christ. Don't you know that all the things that you're praying for work together? They're not your enemy unless you're not wanting to be conformed to Christ. If you're wanting to just be, I just want to be happy. Oh, being with Jesus isn't enough. No, he doesn't really make me that happy. You know, I, you know, what would make me happy is, you know, a new Camaro. That would make me happy too, but, but it wouldn't last that long because I know growing up, man, I said, oh, I've got to have this guitar. I've got to have this particular guitar. And when I got it, I polished it every day and I loved on it. I was so happy and everything. But after a certain period of time, I noticed that I was not putting it away safely in the case as much as I was before. And I wasn't polishing it like it was. And, you know, and so then later on when I got, got a teenager and a little older, I, I wanted a car. And I remember my first car, I loved that car. It was so, man, I mean, I just loved it. I got in there and I, inside out, man, I, I, I the, the inside of it, man, and the uh, leather, the upholstery and everything, man, I just shined it up and the outside and the wheels and all this stuff, you know. And I'm telling you, I'm sorry. I don't know that that lasted two months. One day I went out to the car and I saw dirt on the tires and I went, wow, well, it happens, got in the car. Main, main thing about the car is to get me where I want to go. A new Camaro might make you happy, but it ain't gonna make you happy long. We were made to be inhabited. We were made to be filled with his life. We were made to be one with Jesus. He made us so that we could actually be a vessel and hold another life. He made us that way. How, how much do we access that life? I mean, I know we, you know, again, we, well, I pray every time I get in trouble, every time I got a need, I pray. That's what he's talking about, brother and sister infirm. That's exactly what he's dealing with here. And he's, he's saying all those crumbs that fall from the table are your helpers and workers. They're working for you if you'll just get with me to be conformed to the image of my son. And the Holy Spirit, how much agony do we give him? He's groaning to carry out this purpose. It says that. He's groaning trying to get our, you know, he, God searches our heart to try to get our heart matched up with the mind of the Spirit. Okay, well, that, how long is that going to continue? You know, I, I mean, I, I, I'm sure there's no danger on one hand. I believe in security and all that kind of stuff. I just remember that when, like in the, and I know Old Testament, but it's just a, an example of something that you think about that, you know, before the flood, man, the heart of everyone was wicked and they thought of nothing but, well, you know, we go, oh my God, those people were so bad. They just didn't think about the Lord. I mean, it wasn't about, it wasn't, you know, they were walking around, you know, just show me something and I'll just tear it up and pervert it. <laughs> Excuse me. Translate that for me. <laughs> there are, there are no, yeah, that's fine. There are no, no translations. Imagine what Doug Fisher went through all these years. But I think that's what we, we have thought of when we read there. Their, own, their thoughts were only evil continually. 
<clears throat> the thoughts were not on the Lord. And we've been talking about this in the book of Romans in my class too, where all that stuff that's off came from. If you haven't listened to any of the classes, I suggest you do. Because it wasn't just sin popping up and just randomly doing that because we're sinners. It was because we left union and every manifestation was the opposite of the lamb. And we went down it and went, well, I think the lamb would never do that. Da -da -da -da. Everything, everything was the exact, op it was, but God called it sin because it wasn't the lamb. We say, or he says, you, your sins have separated me, but your sins are a manifestation that you have separated. They're not the issue with God. Jesus died and took care of the sin deal. Why do we, you know, we go, well, praise God that I can just continue, <laughs> continue in sin that grace may abound or whatever, you know? <clears throat> I don't. But I do know that the that the Lord is trying to show us here <clears throat> that in prayer, in prayer, we are infirmed if this is not our goal. We are crippled. We are handicapped. And God, when you come to him, is trying to search your heart and match it up with the mind of the spirit. And the spirit is working interceding for you. Let's, let, me, let me read that again. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity, for we know not. He's, wor he's interceding on our behalf to get us to this mind, this purpose, this spirit, this nature, this way. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Not just, not just loving God and being saved, but being called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow, those who he saved, those who he foreknew at, uh, unto salvation, those that he foreknew that would to bring unto him, that would come unto him, He also wanted them, what is, isn't there a word here that says that, actually? Yeah, verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also. There's an also there. Isn't that, isn't that good? There, it's not just salvation. There's an also behind his purpose and, and within his heart because his purpose came out from his heart. There's an also in there. He says, yes, I foreknew you, but also I want you conformed to the image of my son. Yes. You say, well, I'm predestined for that. It says it right there. I'm predestined for it, you know, <clears throat> so I don't have to worry about it. Okay, Calvinist. <laughs> but I mean, that, you know, I'm predestined for it. Well, if you're predestined, why would God do say anything about you have an infirmity and I'm trying to get you to line up with the spirit and his purposes and you're just causing him to groan over your situation? You know, we say, well, I just don't pray or when I pray, I know it's carnal, but whatever. Okay, so you're, you're putting the Holy Spirit into this groaning situation where he's, he's not looking at it and going, it's fine, you're saved. You know what I'm saying? He's not looking at that. He's groaning over it, going, this is, I, my part, God sent me, you know the examples in the scriptures? In the Old Testament of Eliezer, Abraham representing the father, and Isaac his son, and, and wanting a bride for himself. And, and so he sent Eliezer, the Holy Spirit, into Haran to bring back a bride from that foreign land unto his son. And 
you see the Holy Spirit when he gets there and he's going, he's, he's, he finds the bride and he wants to bring her. He's got one thing on his mind. I want to get her to him. I want there to be a union. You, you see the wonderful, when she finally arrives with Isaac, the wonderful marriage ceremony with all the flowers. And all. No, you don't see any of that. She comes down from the camel, goes into the tent. <laughs> boom, they're one. That's it. There's your marriage because there's your union. And, and the Holy Spirit's going, I did my job. But he's not happy when they're holding him when he goes to Haran and they go, oh, stay a little while longer. We like you, Holy Spirit. Give us gifts. Because remember, he gave He came and he gave them gifts. And they go, oh, I like this. You know, I like these gifts. You know? And, I, you know, all of the things. Oh, tell us, tell us about Abraham. He's going, I don't want to tell you about Father Abraham. I want to tell her about Isaac. And he says, please, you can hear it, really, read it. He's pleading, please, don't hold me from my task. Don't make me stay here. Get me out of this place. And let me get her to him. John the Baptist, picture of the Holy Spirit in the sense of all he does is point to Jesus. I have come to declare one. Who are you? The voice of one. And then when they examine him, he says, I, I, I'd be better off just reading it to you to see that picture. He says, Ye yourselves bear me witness. This is John the Baptist, but it's the Spirit of the Holy Spirit who came to declare Christ. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride, he's talking about Jesus. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, not me. I'm not it. The Holy Spirit didn't come to declare himself. I'm not it. I'm not it. I'm here to declare Jesus. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom the friend of the bridegroom who standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase and I must decrease. The Holy Spirit's not trying to become greater in churches. We need more of the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit to reveal Christ so that so that the bridegroom increases in our lives. There's an also here. The also is good. Him who he foreknew, he also wanted you to be in line with the purpose to be conformed to Christ, to be conformed to the image of his son. And that, when that's not happening, the Holy Spirit groans. When he hears junk out of our mouth that is so the opposite of the lamb, we grieve the Holy Spirit. It says that in Ephesians. It says that. We go, he's grieved with sin. He's grieved with what's not Christ. He's grieved that he's not accomplishing his purpose. He's, grie he's grieved because his mind is one way, but he searches our heart and he finds that we're infirmed and he can't get you. And he didn't come to Haran to hang out or, or you know, Jesus, the Holy Spirit didn't come to the earth to hang out or just enjoy or whatever. He came with purpose and he's, he, he groans over that purpose. Again, the intercession and groaning is not trying to get our prayers answered. It's trying to change the course of our prayers by changing the hearts of men. Changing them from, I'll say it like this, from being Christians to being bride. I want to, I want to be conformed to your image. I want to take your name. I want to... I want all of those changes to be real and not just talk, not just religion. 
And I'll end with this, verse 29. <clears throat> For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that. There's the purpose for being conformed to the image of his son, that he might be. This is about him. This is not about us. This is about him, that he might be the firstborn. We, you know, we don't see the purpose. We don't see the greater picture. We just see us. We see us in earth. We see, we, we, we see the problems. We, see, we say, I'm so hungry for the Lord, and crumbs fall from the table because the hunger many times is not after him. It is after what he'll do. So, why is all this important? For him. For him. For him. That he might be something. And that's just like the Holy Spirit. That he, the scripture we read there, this my joy is fulfilled. The friend of the bridegroom rejoices at the voice of the bridegroom, not to himself, but to her and this communion, this sharing of hearts, this release of eternal breath, because that's, that's the spirit, the breath of God, the breath of God. When Jesus rose from the dead, he saw his disciples and he drew him near and he breathed on him. That's what it says. That's the breath. It's a whole, oh, receive you the Holy Spirit. Receive my breath. What's the environment that's inside of me? I want to breathe that into you. I want to put it in you. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. In other words, let what's in me come into you. The breath of the living God, the Filling our lungs with the environment of what, where he lives. The, the, I don't even know how to put it into words. Into an environment that is him and in which he lives. And it comes into us. And Jesus, I mean, I mean, what kind of deal is that? He raises from the dead and he just breathes on him. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. He's trying to communicate, and we can't hear him. And we try to communicate on our level, and he can't hear us. And it breaks his heart, and it frustrates and groans, causes groaning for the Holy Spirit. And there is no joy of the voice of the bridegroom. There's only Jesus, my Savior. And we miss we miss the real issues, the real issues, because we're still infirmed. We are infirmed. We are every bit as crippled as anyone physically would be, except for the issues are greater to the Lord. Issues are greater to the Lord. <sighs> Amen. Amen. Why don't we just stand together and we'll pray. <clears throat> Blessed be the Lamb of God. Father, I just pray that your spirit is active in our hearts and in our lives. That we are not just semi-sensitive when we come to church building. But Lord, when we're away from here, our hearts pant after you like a deer after the water brooks. That our, our souls cry out from, because our spirit is so desirous of you. That our souls cry out for you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, forgive us. We don't want to put you through this kind of stuff. 
We ask you to tenderize our hearts because he that searches the hearts also knows the mind of the Spirit and wants to bring us to one purpose. God, let your Spirit intercede. Lord, a divine intervention. Lord, an intervention for sure. And help us to be awakened awakened not to deeper things but to be able to hear your voice for what you mean when you speak and when you answer our prayers and they seem so different from what we asked or we ask you a question and it seems to go in another direction let that be a flag to us that says I need to hear I need to hear the language of God Christ and him crucified. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. God bless you. I love you. I love the Lord. We're dismissed.